and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and well, I somehow found the time, let's put it that way, to record another tier list video. And as I had stated in my previous one about dragon characters in fiction broadly speaking, I wanted to do a tier list ranking, well, not all, but a lot of A Song of Ice and Fire characters, because as I've stated numerous times on my channel, I am a huge A Song of Ice and Fire fan. So as you can see, I selected a fair few characters. They're all, no, not quite all point of view characters, but they're all important characters to a greater or lesser degree. Agree. I will be ranking them primarily on how much I like them, basically, going over what I like about them or what I dislike about them. Sometimes I might rank a character I don't really like higher than you might assume because because, for example, I think they're a good villain, things like that, so that might happen as well. First we have Arian Martel, the princess in the tower. As you can see, I took art, or I mean fan art, of all the book characters. Didn't take any pictures of the Game of Thrones actors, because I really want to make it clear this is about A Song of Ice and Fire, not Game of Thrones, the TV series. I really like Arian Martel. I always enjoy reading her chapters. She is kind of a seductress character, but with non-negligible political aspirations. And I like her passion, though that doesn't always turn out so well, does it, if you uh, know the plot of uh, all the books that are currently out. So I really like Ariane, but I'm not sure if she's like A tier worthy or top of B tier worthy. I'm going to plonk her an A tier for now. Then we have Arya of House Stark. Now, she's one of my favourite characters in the books. Hated, hated, hated what they did to her arc in the TV show. Well, I mean, I enjoy her story, though it is a profoundly tragic one. That's a thing the show, yeah, I have to mention it, completely missed. Her arc is a tragic one. They transformed her into this badass, Mary Sue assassin character. But what happens to her in the books is freaking tragic. This is a child who's gone through mountains of trauma, who's becoming extremely violent and sociopathic almost. That is something tragic and to be sad about, not something to be celebrated. In the name of pseudo, and I insist on the word pseudo, SJW feminist pop culture bullshit. But she's a great character, a great child character, and I don't usually like child characters. Gender non-conforming, great relationship with Nymeria, which, well, you know what happens with that. I really hope they reconnect somehow, though, in books six and or seven. So yeah, for me, Arya is an obvious S-tier character. Then we have Asha Greyjoy. I really like Asha Greyjoy, another strong female character. What I find interesting is that she is a gender non-conforming character, but she's straight. In the books, we only know of heterosexual relationships she engages in. For some bloody reason, once again, in the TV show, they decided to bisexualize her, all right? But then some of the characters which engage in in homosexual or bisexual behavior in the books don't get that treatment at all in the series. Again, go figure, whatever. A warrior, but bent ultimately on finding a peaceful resolution to what is happening to her islands, her culture. So I think she's very interesting in that regard. Really curious to know what's going to happen to her in the Winds of Winter. Again, is she A tier worthy or B tier worthy? Oh, that's hard. I also kind of want to put her in. A tier, but I guess B tier for now? Do I like her more than Aaron Martell? Do you get more of her than Aaron Martell? I think you get a bit more of Aaron Martell. I'll leave it like that for now. Then we have Barristan Selmy, Sir Grandfather. He's a character I think I got attached to, though he's very conservative as well. He's a good source of guidance for Daenerys, especially in Slave's Bay, and well, he gives her information about her brother Rhaegar and kind of helps her to contextualize her family history and the history of Westeros, at least the current history of Westeros. I think he's a valuable character. I like him, but he definitely has major flaws in the sense that he is very conservative in a way, perhaps not forward thinking enough or flexible thinking enough if you see what I mean. I think he's a solid B tier character too, but 
below Asher Greyjoy, definitely. Bran Stark, yes. So, I like Bran Stark. I like reading his chapters. I don't know what's going to happen to him, though. I mean, there are conflicting theories about whether or not it's going to follow what happened in the TV series or not. There is a bit of a God Emperor vibe going on, and I've been drowning in God Emperor stuff. Reading Dune, they're interesting little callbacks to Dune in the Saga of Mice and Fire, in my opinion. But it's not just my opinion. I mean, other people have remarked upon this. Poor kid, in a way. His legs are paralyzed, but then his mind opens up to all these possibilities. Perhaps manipulation by Brendan Rivers. Perhaps manipulation by the children of the forest. Who knows what they're really up to? But I really like him as a character. I would put him solidly in B tier as well, above Barristan Salmi. I guess since he is one of the major characters of the series, above Asher Greyjoy as well. Or maybe he's lower A tier. He's a well realized child character, I think. Maybe. Okay, below Aaron Martell. Ah, we have Brienne of Tarth. She's a Brilliant examination of what gender does to people and how gender can fuck with you, basically. Because she's described in the books as being ugly. Yeah, straight up ugly. She does not have a pretty face at all. She's very big and massive. So she cannot fit into her society's ideals of femininity, of womanhood. So she's like, well, screw that. I'm going to become a knight. And then uh, she becomes a great knight as well. And I love her relationship with Jamie and their journey through the Riverlands. Those are great chapters in the Storm of Swords. She's definitely a favorite of mine as well. And there's something so sad but touching about her because even though she embraces knighthood, a part of her wants to be this lady who will find a man to love her because she's in love with her king, Renly Baratheon. But Renly Baratheon is gay, so that was never going to work out for her. She kind of wants to be traditionally feminine in a way, but that's just inaccessible to her. And so she has a lot of pent-up rage and resentment, which she channels through being a knight. At the same time, she also has this very idealized and naive view of what a knight is and of course being the world of a song of ice and fire she gets those ideals smashed into the ground for her i loved reading her chapters in a feast for crows a feast for crows doesn't get nearly as much love as it should in my opinion so once again this is an obvious a tier character for me i guess between aaron martell and brandon stark for now then we have Catelyn Stark. I'm not a big fan of Catelyn Stark. Never was. But I do think, I mean, all of George R. R. Martin's characters are interesting. His character work is phenomenal. Can we just all agree on that? She makes a lot of mistakes. She's so cruel and mean to Jon Snow. A lot crueler and meaner than in the show, by the way. And fine, she loves her children, but she makes some pretty rash and stupid decisions based on that. The whole episode with Tyrion and her going to the Eyrie to see her sister. But she's not an idiot either. I don't think that at all. She is a very brave and strong woman. I mean, to be fair, she goes through a lot of personal tragedy and I was not happy at all that she got killed at the Red Wedding. Like, I, I didn't hate her. I just don't like her very much. But she's definitely an interesting examination of the mother figure and all the complex emotions that go with being a mother and with motherhood in general. She's going also in B tier for me, I guess below Asha Greyjoy, but above Barristan Selmy. Then we have Cersei Lannister. Cersei Lannister is a character I love to hate. She's a massive bitch, let's be real. She's going insane. Let's be real here too, like she burns the Tower of the Hand with wildfire. Lots of interesting parallels to Mad King Ares II. But what I like about her point of view chapters, and that's something I think Martin did brilliantly well, once again, kind of like with Brienne of Tarth, he examines how gender fucks with people. A lot of the time Cersei says, if I were a man, I would have been treated differently. And this is made painfully clear to her all the more because she has a twin brother. And as children, they would get confused for one another. And well, they were extremely close. They are extremely close because they're lovers. But well, 
that's a whole other thing. And she says, why did my brother get to play with a sword just because, well, he has a penis, basically. I can do things. I'm resourceful. To be fair, she's not that resourceful, ultimately. Like, she thinks she's a lot more intelligent than she actually is. But her frustration and her resentment as a woman is something I can definitely relate to, even though she's a bitch. And she objectifies her children to a certain point because she kind of uses them as a tool for power, for gaining and retaining power, even though I do think she does love her children, but it's not quite good enough. She uses that as an excuse a bit too much. I really think she's a fascinating character. And a lot of people take issue with what happens between her and Tana Merriweather, like that whole sex scene, which is a bit cringy to read through, I'll admit. But there as well, it's a really interesting scene from a psychological perspective because she's trying to put on the mantle of masculinity that was in a way denied her because she is female and trying to, I guess, understand and work through the trauma of her having been married to Robert Baratheon, who was a massive asshole. So that scene was really interesting, her trying to understand sexuality from a man's perspective. It is cringy to read through. Yes, I agree. But from a psychological perspective, I thought it was a fascinating scene and it was actually well realized. That's my hot take on that. I don't like Cersei, but I find her fascinating. I really want to know what's going to happen with her. She's not quite A tier, but she's definitely going in B tier above Catelyn Stark for me. Catelyn Stark and Cersei Lannister offer up an interesting contrast with the theme of motherhood. While they are different, they have interesting parallels of like using their maternal love to justify things which are questionable or not that intelligent, and I find that interesting. Then we come to my favourite character, which is none other than Daenerys Targaryen. So. Before anything else, we're going to put her straight into S tier. Daenerys has dragons. <laughs> okay, I should elaborate. She survives incredible trauma. She's sold into sexual slavery to Khal Drogo. A bit of a Stockholm Syndrome situation going on because she ends up loving him. She ascends to power. She listens to people around her. Sometimes she doesn't, though. I'm not saying she's flawless by any means. Sometimes she makes stupid decisions, especially in Slaver's Bay. She's trying to make the best of a fairly shitty situation, to be fair. She maintains a core of compassion in her heart, even though she also makes fairly cruel and trashy level decisions, like executing all those slavers from the age of 12 years old. That's pretty bloody brutal. She has dragons. She's the mother and daughter and bride of dragons. Her babies are dragons. And I love that. I absolutely adore that. You don't see that in the TV show, but she freaking breastfeeds her dragons. That's how deep the maternal bond goes between her and her non-human children. It's something which they completely failed to convey in the TV show, again I might add, when Viserion dies in the north, she should have been devastated because that was one of her children. That's the thing they didn't manage to put across to the viewers, those dragons aren't her pets, they're like her children. She should have been much more devastated when Viserion died, and then when Rhaegal died, because she lost her children. Then we have Davos Seaworth, the Onion Knight. Another character I find very interesting. Song of Ice and Fire displays a wide range of very great characters, we all agreed. Davos Seaworth, I think, is fundamentally, though, a good man serving a just king, sure, but I am not a Stannis fan, and I think he's a massive asshole, even though, yes, he is just in a way, but we'll get back to him. Davos, I think, deserves better in a way in terms of a king to follow than Stannis Baratheon. And yeah, I think he's a good character, and he's also like a major point of view character. So he's going in B tier. I would put him between Catelyn Stark and Cersei Lannister. Then we have Euron Greyjoy, which oh, he was murdered by the showrunners. Just, oh, let's not get into it. Euron Greyjoy is supposed to be bloody freaking terrifying, a crazy madman of Lovecraftian aspirations. He's a great villain, or at least he has the potential of becoming a great villain. I feel like he has a lot more to do and a greater role to play in the coming books given that they have come out 
So yeah, I really like you on Greyjoy. Creepy, insane, menacing, sudden. However, you don't have much to go on as of yet in the books. So as such, he's going to be my first C tier character. Not because I think he's bad, just because I want to wait a bit to see what's going to happen to him. My personal theory is that he's going to try and do some, like I said, Lovecraftian level bullshit and it's gonna make him insane i mean completely insane his brain is gonna become mush then we have well i subscribe to the fagon theory so aegon targaryen presumably the son of rhaegar and elia martell but i'm personally of the group that believes he's not actually their son he's some kind of blackfire descendant perhaps or related to um illyrio mopatis one of those so i call him fagon i don't really care about fagon so far i think he has a greater role to play in the winds of winter but he'll mostly be there to assemble different characters around king's landing i think there's going to be something to do with aaron martell and just more the plot forward with the political machinations, etc. Seems like a decent dude. I was gonna say a decent kid. I mean, he's an adolescent, an older adolescent. He's being groomed to be a good king. But I feel like there's an aura of, like, bullshit surrounding him. I just don't quite believe in him. So, I'm going to put him in D tier. I don't think he's a bad character as such. I just think he's more of a plot device as of now. Than anything else. And we have Jamie Lannister. Jamie Lannister is a great character. He's a great character because he has a great character arc. His evolution throughout the books is so, so engaging and so interesting to follow and so rewarding in a way. He's not my favorite. Some people definitely adore him. I wouldn't say I adore him, but I find him so interesting. You know what? I'm going to put him in A tier. At the bottom of A tier for now. I really, really enjoy his story in the Song of Ice and Fire. I'm very curious to see where that goes. Then we have Joffrey Baratheon slash Lannister, the King Little Shit, which is another character, I guess. Well, no, I didn't love to hate him. I just hated him. He was an asshole, a budding sociopath. I was so happy that he died at the Purple Wedding. For once, one of the bad guys actually croaks. So, mate. You're going straight into D tier. Then we have John Connington. John Connington is interesting in so far as it gives you a glimpse into the character of Rhaegar Targaryen. It is strongly, strongly suggested that John Connington was in love with Rhaegar Targaryen and as such would be a gay character in A Song of Ice and Fire. Again, kind of like the perhaps not quite generic figure of the loyal knight, of the loyal follower who really wants to put Fagon slash Young Griff on the throne to honour his relationship with Rhaegar Targaryen. I do think the bit about him participating in Robert's rebellion with the bells, I find that interesting because I think that might play a part in the books to come based on some of the stuff that actually happened in the TV series. The whole thing with the bells in the TV series, I think that's actually reference to John Collington who got some kind of PTSD with those bells in that village during Robert's Rebellion. It's alright. I would need more with John Connington to have a stronger opinion either way, so as such, I'm just gonna put him in C tier for now. Then we come to Jon Snow. Yes, Jon Snow. The bastard. I don't dislike Jon Snow. I am not a Jon Snow stan. I personally think it would be more interesting if he stayed dead. Some people are convinced that since he was resurrected in the TV show, that means he will be resurrected in the books. I don't think the TV show is confirmation of anything personally, and I will stick to that. However, yes, I agree, it's highly likely that he will be resurrected in the winds of winter. I'd be interested, though, to have, like, a point of view from him within Ghost. That'd be cool. Or to have him be resurrected, but then you never get a point of view chapter from him again and see him through the eyes of other characters. That I would find fascinating because his resurrection will have to affect his character in some way to be credible, to be of any significance to the story, right? So he's an engaging character, he's like the underdog. There are parallels with Daenerys as well, but I find him less compelling than Daenerys. So to me, he's, he's a BT character. So I'm going to put him below. I do like his interactions with ghosts, though. 
<laughs> so, okay, fine. I'll put him above Davos Seaworth. We come then to Marjorie Tyrell. Now, Marjorie Tyrell has a less of a role or less prominent of a role in the books than they gave her in the TV series. She's an interesting counterweight within the Tyrell family to Cersei Lannister and her retainers. I do like the political dynamics between the Tyrells and the Lannisters in A Feast for Crows. But I would need to see a bit more active Marjorie in the books, again, to feel more strongly about her. For now, I'd say she's a strong C-tier character. I'm going to put her above John Connington. Then we come to the character I loathe the most in the series, and that would be Melisandre of Ashai. I hate her. I straight up hate her. I do find her interesting. I find most of these characters interesting, if you can tell. But I hate her because she's a religious extremist, basically. She's that prophet for Hlor, convinced of the importance of Stannis Baratheon and worshipping at his feet, or I mean worshipping at the feet of Hlor through Stannis Baratheon, but then she kind of figures that maybe, mm, maybe I made a mistake there, maybe I should focus on Jon Snow. I really like reading her point of view chapters and I want more of them, but I hate her. She pisses me off so much. She's gonna go in detail for me, but again, keep in mind, I don't think she's a badly realized character. I just hate her. Next we have Missandei of Nath. So she was a character that was majorly changed from book to series. In the books, we're all rich. He is seemingly a child of about 10 or 11 years old. A slave, bought then freed by Danny. And she does seem quite wise for a child. I've read some theories that she might actually be a spy for some faction or another. Maybe linked to Quaith. I don't know, or maybe Marwyn the mage. There might be more to her. I do like her, though, as a companion for Daenerys and as a tertiary character. I need to see more of her, though. So as such, I'm going to, again, put her in C tier, I guess. Bottom of C tier. Well, then we have poor old Ned Stark, who dies at the end of A Game of Thrones. It is made pretty clear to you pretty early on that he might be just a bit too good for the world he lives in and a bit naive. At times, he's too good for his own good. You know what I mean? Like, he sticks to his principles, but it's like that parable of, like, the reed and the tree, whatever. I can't remember what it's called. If you're too rigid and you have strong wind currents, you're going to snap and die. You need a bit more flexibility to survive. It's kind of that idea. He sticks by his principles so much even when it's clear it's not the right thing to do, it's not the clever thing to do. And it's not the most beneficial thing to do on the long term. And so, well, he gets his head chopped off. <laughs> well, he didn't expect to get his head chopped off, to be fair. Again, a solid B tier character. I think I'd put him beneath Catelyn Stark. I guess I find Catelyn Stark just a tad more interesting. Then we come to Oberyn of House Martell, the Red Viper. One character I do think the showrunners got right and cast magnificently. That was a great performance. Oberyn, for the little you get of him, is quite a colourful character, and I enjoyed him. Of course, he made the fatal, gruesomely fatal mistake of taunting his adversary when his adversary was down. That's killing your enemies 101. You don't just sit around and talk to them. You just kill them. If you're going to kill someone, you do it. No dilly-dallying and talking to them like, you killed and raped my sister, blah blah blah. You kill him, mate. And no, well, you died instead. Like, stupid. I did like his interactions with Tyrion, mind you. So, solid C T character as well. I think I'll put him... Uh, just below your own Greyjoy. Olena Tyrell, or Olena Redwine, the Queen of Thorns. Also another great performance in the TV show, by the way. A fairly minor role in the books, though not that minor since she orchestrated or participated in the orchestration of the Purple Wedding. But I really loved that old wizened woman. Talk about an intelligent character. She's kind of on that level with Tywin Lannister, but more in the background. So again, you don't get much of her, but I really enjoyed her presence presence in the books. And thus, I shall put her, again, in B tier. I think I'll put her between Catelyn Stark and Ned Stark. Peter Baelish, a very cunning character, a very intelligent and sociopathic character. Is he truly a sociopath? 
I don't know, because he says he was madly in love with Catelyn Stark. And now he's got this weird, creepy obsession with Sansa Stark. He's definitely got something brewing, something big. And he's definitely not a good character in any sense of the word. He's a great antagonist, though. As such, I shall put him in A tier. He's an A tier worthy villain in a way. Perhaps bottom of A tier. He's a lot more intelligent than Cersei. So Cersei stays in B tier. But to me, both of these are really good villains. Then we have Ramsay Bolton, the bastard of the Dreadfort. Truly, I believe, a sociopath, along with Joffrey Baratheon. Wow, is he a sadistic, crazy, creepy monster. Very cunning. That whole mind game torture porn fest he has going on with Theon was just so horrible, but very well executed, of course. And that's a character you can just straight up hate. He's evil, right? He almost wily seeks the approval of his father and wants recognition from his father to be his official heir. So that was kind of interesting. But yeah, he's a monster. And as a monster, he is also going to go in D tier because you just straight up hate him. I guess I'm going to put him just below Melisandre because Melisandre, I really hate her. But I want to know more about her background and her character psychology. Ramsay, I just know. He's a sadistic sociopath and that's about it. Then we have Robert Baratheon, affectionately termed Bobby B. I never got the love he got on Reddit and spaces like that. I don't really care about him. He was a shit king. I guess <laughs> in the history of Westeros, they have had worst kings like Aegon IV, just saying. But he's not a good king. He was a good warrior, but he's a shit ruler. He admits it himself. Like, he doesn't want the job. The job bores him. And he's kind of an asshole. I mean, he's abusive towards Cersei, and even though Cersei is a bitch, domestic abuse and violence is never okay. I mean, it is a patriarchal, misogynistic society, but there are characters fighting against that, and it is wrong. So he's an asshole, as far as I'm concerned. He doesn't really care that much about his kids, though, I mean, he does regret, as he's dying, the fact that he hasn't taken a more active role as a father to who he thinks are his children. So, you know, I never liked... Bobby B. I don't care about him. I don't care that he died. I mean, contrasted to Ned Stark, especially, like, Ned Stark to me is a much better person and a more interesting person than Robert Baratheon. So, you know what? I'm just going to put him in D tier. I don't care. Like, fine. Uh, he's better than Joffrey. Like, Joffrey's a straight up again budding sociopath and less interesting than Young Griff because, well, we don't really know where Young Griff is going as of yet. We come to Rob Stark. They made him a much more prominent character in the TV show. In the books, you never get a single point of view chapter from him. But ultimately, well, his arc is fairly tragic, given the Red Wedding. He tried to do the best he could in a way, given his age, given the tragedy that surrounds him. That was touching in a way, but I never much cared for him as a character. So for me, yeah, he's just a C tier, solid C tier. I guess I'll put him at the bottom of C tier. Um, no, maybe above John Connington. And I'm going to put Miss Ande above John Connington as well because she's a companion to Danny and I like her better than John Con. Then we have Samuel Tarly, who is also one of my favourite characters in the series. He's the quintessential nerd with a heart of gold. And despite however many times he says he's a coward, he is incredibly brave in a way. He kills a frick. In other, can you please take a minute to appreciate that, to protect someone who is even more vulnerable than him? I'm so excited to see what's going to happen with him at the Citadel and his interactions with Marwyn the Mage, even though Marwyn the Mage is actually leaving the Citadel, and what he's going to do. I expect great things for Sam the Slayer, and yeah, I love him. So clearly for me, that's an S tier character as well. Then we have Sandor Clegane, the Hound. I never understood the love he gets by some people in the fandom. I think he's an asshole. I don't get what people see in the Hound. Unless, though, if the theory about him being at... Oh, 
crap, what's it called? The Quiet Isle? Oh, I'm blanking massively here, but basically that monastic isle where you have some people who follow the faith of the seven who stay there. There's this like groundskeeper who has taken a vow of silence. A lot of people have theorized that that's actually Sandor Clegane. If that is Sandor Clegane and he's renounced his pathway of violence and cynicism, yeah, he might be a bit more appreciable in my eyes. Maybe. But as he is throughout most of the books, I don't like him. I understand he has mitigating circumstances. He was abused as a child by his older brother. He was traumatized by the death of his little sister. Was that it? I can't remember exactly. And yeah, sure, he does say fuck you to the Lannisters and leaves. But he does nothing for me. I don't like him. And this whole sand sand thing, that ship just goes so over my head. Like, no! Why do people want to see Sansa end up with him? That is so weird. I never got that ship. It's disturbing to me. So I don't think he's quite deep tier worthy, but uh, yeah, it's going to be bottom of C tier for me. I just, I don't get the love he gets from, like I said, some parts of the fandom. Then we have the Sand Snakes. So I decided to take the Sand Snakes as a whole instead of individually. I really love the Sand Snakes and their interactions with Arian. Martell. I like the different things they're doing. I do like Sorella Sand being at the Citadel as Alaris the Sphinx and her association with Marwyn the Mage and so obviously her future association with Samwell, that's going to be interesting. I like Tyne's relationship with Arian Martell. So yeah, I really like the Sand Snakes. To me, they're solid B tier characters, but probably, I mean, lower B because they haven't been, I guess, as fleshed out as I'd want it to be so far. Sansa Stark. I am not a fan of Sansa Stark. I don't like her. Well, I mean, I don't like her for most of the books. She starts to get interesting to me in book four when she gets to the Eerie and ends up under the tutelage of Peter Baelish. But let's be real here, Peter Baelish wants to fuck her ultimately. But I don't like her. She's just so stereotypically girly-ish for the first couple of books. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with being that way, mind you, okay? It's just that kind of personality does not mesh with my kind of personality. She's very gender conforming. She She's very naive, has these ideals of the lady and the knight and great love stories like, what was it, Jonquil and Florian, and she got on my nerves and I'm like, wake up. To me, she takes such a long time to become aware of the actual world she's living in. I mean, I understand these are very young characters, right? She's like 11, 12 years old. So she's a fairly young and she's been very sheltered for most of her life. But she got on my nerves. She's getting interesting now. I mean, she starts getting interesting in Feast of the Crows, like I said. So there's potential there. She's starting to understand the Game of Thrones and learning from Cersei, learning from Peter Baelish. That might go in interesting directions. Directions. For now, I guess I'll put her, yeah, just below Euron Greyjoy. I think actually they kind of stand on the same level. I prefer Euron Greyjoy. I enjoy him more as a villain than I enjoy Sansa as a better character, but I guess technically they stand on the same level. Then we have Stannis the Manus. Ooh, like I said, I don't like him. I don't get the cult following he has. I mean, some people don't get the cult following Daenerys has, and I wouldn't say I'm part of that cult following, by the way. I don't believe in that. I'm a fan of hers, but even I can acknowledge her flaws. And she's also very young, so I mean, it's normal that she makes some pretty stupid decisions, given lots of things. Stannis the Manus. Okay, fine. He's a good military commander. He is just, maybe, like, a lot is made of him being just, and applying mercy where mercy is warranted, and applying harshness where harshness is warranted. But that gets a bit old after a while, and some people find him really funny. I guess sometimes, yeah, sure, he displays a dry kind of humor. I don't know, he pisses me off. He's an asshole. He's not an evil asshole, but he's an asshole nonetheless. He's very unflexible, and I think that's gonna bite him in the ass like it bit Ned Stark in the ass. He's not quite as inflexible as Ned Stark, mind you, because he got out of it just in time, so I think he's a bit more clever, let's put it that way. But I don't think it's going to end well for him, especially under the influence of Melisandre. So Stannis the Manus, again, is going to be 
oh, just to trigger his fan base, I'm going to put him in t I'm going to put him um, just below Melisandre. Then we have Lady Stoneheart. I decided to consider her on her own separately from, well, Catelyn Stark, because she is kind of a different character in a way. But she's an extension of Catelyn Stark, obviously, because she's a Revenant version of Catelyn Stark. So if I had taken Catelyn Stark and Lady Stoneheart as a single entity, I would have probably bumped her up a bit, put her in eight here. Separately, I think they're both B tier worthy. Or, I don't know, I think Lady Stoneheart is interesting in the sense that she's like the incarnation of revenge. She's this revenant that's been stripped of everything good that characterized her as a living human being and is now this rage and hatred fueled monster that wants to annihilate House Frey. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen with her, Brienne, and Jaime. But beyond that, though, what is she ultimately? There's not much to her, unless perhaps with like the whole world building thing of whites and fire whites, you know, we'll see where that goes. As it stands, I'm going to put her in C tier, I think. I'll put her between Marjorie, or just above, just above Marjorie Tyrell. She does have like that creepy terror factor to her that I think is fairly well executed. Theon Greyjoy. So he was another character that has quite the traumatic and interesting arc. He starts out as being a bit of an asshole youth. Not bad, though, until, of course, he betrays Rob Stark and the Starks and makes a massively stupid decision to think he's going to be the heir to his father, Balon Greyjoy, and then that goes south so quickly, and then he gets um, captured by Ramsay Bolton, and we all know what happens with that. I said he's not evil. Well, I mean, he does something pretty evil. He freaking kills two boys. In my personal opinion, I think he's paid for it. I think he's paid his debt, okay, because he goes through some pretty horrendous freaking torture. The guy has PTSD for the rest of his life, or probably will have PTSD for the rest of his life. I think there is a potential at redemption for him that's hinted at in some of the previous chapters for the Winds of Winter. So, bad is happening to you, don't wash out the bad deeds you did to others. We're all agreed here, but I think, let's just say karma-wise, the debt is settled, I think. His story arc is very, very interesting. So, yeah, I'm going to put him in B tier as well. I'm going to put him just below Jon Snow and above Davos Seaworth. Keep in mind, I think they're all kind of sitting on the same level. And we have Tyrion Lannister. I can already tell you, let's do this right away, that he's an S tier character for me. He's one of my favorite characters as well. I love his point of view chapters. So bloody interesting. Complex, deep psychology. Not a necessarily good person by any means, mind you. And he's going on a very, very, very dark path. I mean, he rapes a woman in A Dance with Dragons. He's becoming more and more consumed by bitterness, hatred towards his family, and just being angry at his life circumstances and the things that were done to him and just being betrayed by even the one person he thought really loved him in his family which was Jamie. Fascinating character, a very intelligent character. And he did try his best in King's Landing and no one appreciated what he did for King's Landing. So obviously that also fuels his bitterness. But I mean he does rape a woman. He does do bad things. He's not innocent by any means. He's just a fascinating Shades of Grey character and definitely one of my favorites in the series. Like father, like son, I don't know yet, but we come to Tywin Lannister. Tywin Lannister is also a good villain, I guess in a way. Again, he's an asshole. Ultimately, he only cares about his family name. And I think there's an important distinction to be made. I think he cares about his family name, not so much his actual living family members. And ironically, I think Cersei is kind of doing the same thing. He is using his children as tools for power and to maintain the prestige of his house name. But does he actually care about his children as individuals? I'm not convinced of that. Of course, he hates Tyrion, who he disinherit if he could. I mean, he does disinherit and disavow him because of well, the trial and he wants him to take the black and all that. And he's disappointed in his son, who goes into the King's Guard, and he's pissed at his daughter because his daughter doesn't want to be used as a broodmare, like 
character, understandable. Supposedly, he was such a better person when Joanna Lannister was still alive. The love of his life and his best friend, or one of his best friends, was Ares II before he went crazy. So there's that whole background that kind of poses a question mark as to his true nature. But ultimately, as we see him in the books, he's an asshole, and I was very happy when Tyrion killed him. Rest in not so much peace, Tywin Lannister. But he's a good character. I mean, he's an interesting character and a good villain. So again, it's going to be, I guess, C tier for me because I just don't like him. Probably, though, above Oberyn Martell because of the way he's realized. Then we have a Varys Spider. And I don't really know how to place him. What is his end game? He keeps telling that what he cares about are the small folk, the downtrodden, the realm. That might be true. But there's also his connection to Illyrio Mopatis and perhaps the Blackfire descendants in the Golden Company. So what is he really about? Is he supporting the Targaryens? Is he not? I don't know. But I love reading about him in the books. So he's going in A tier for me. Just, I mean, technically he's like on level footing with Peter Baelish, but I'll just put him at the end of A tier. And finally, we have Egret. I liked her, again, for the little bit you get of her in A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords. A good, slightly gender non-conforming character, kind of uh, whipping Jon Snow up into shape. Um, their relationship was great, though. I love their relationship. It worked so well. Her teaching him the ways of the true North and how ignorant he is and all of that. Another solid BT character. I guess I'll put her below Catelyn Stark and above the Queen of Thorns. But I mean, a lot of those are kind of on the same level. I realise I didn't include Doran Martell. To me, he'd probably go in C tier as well for the little you get of him. I do find him interesting. I find his reluctance to go to war and the conflict that creates with Aaron Martell interesting. But then you realise that He's actually planning the long game and he's very intelligent and has presumably a lot of things planned for House Martell. So from what you get of him in the book so far, he'd probably be for me high C tier to lower B tier. He's also an interesting and intriguing character. So yeah, that's uh, my tier list for a bunch of a song of Ice and Fire characters. You can always add a character I omitted and I'll reply in the comments in which tier I would place them if you want to do that. I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, whichever time of day you prefer. Take good care of yourselves and well, I shall see you in the next video, whenever that is. Goodbye.